Welcome back to another marvelous video. We all know that in Tolkien's lore there existed beings that seemed like hatred incarnate at first glance. The race of orcs was an extension of the evil that plagued Middle-earth. We'll soon talk about that, but Tolkien felt deeply unsatisfied about the origins of the orcs and continually revised their story. But let's say that orcs were indeed corrupted elves. They're intelligent and sentient, yes, but when did these beings cease to possess a soul? Today, we're focusing on a select few to count down the strongest orcs to exist in Tolkien's legendarium. Be wary, though, as one of them seems constantly ravenous for hobbit flesh. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Help. <laughs> Squeal! No one's gonna save you now. Grishnok! Let's begin with the captain of Mordor himself. This orc is guilty of wanting to gut and devour two stinking, <laughs> sorry, innocent hobbits. Even before his encounter with members of the Fellowship, it was heavily suggested that the captain of Mordor played a part in Gollum's torture. This informed him of the existence of the One Ring and the power it held. One might even argue that the One Ring had worked its temptation on Grishnok's mind, which inevitably led to his grisly demise. It all began at Parth Galen, where the Fellowship camped after they departed from Lorien. Soon, the shadow befell them, as Boromir, convinced of the Ring's power, tried to seize it from Frodo. Though his redemption was swift and tragic, he died defending Merry and Pippin from a host of uruk who swarmed the surrounding woods. On the other hand, Frodo and Sam had slipped away and continued their journey down the river towards Emin Mule. Grishnok was one of many orcs of the Uruk raiding party which took Merry and Pippin prisoner. He then met up with his host of orcs from Mordor by the plains of Rohan. When an unconscious Pippin finally came to, he heard an eerily soft but malicious voice arguing with the mountain orcs and Ugluck as he threatened to report their shenanigans straight to Barad-dûr. They butt heads regarding what needed to be done with the two hobbits. Convinced they were the ring bearers, Grishnok wanted to take them straight to Mordor, while Ugluck was given orders to bring them to Isengard. Grishnok even regathered his gang and split up from the Uruks. However, he was forced to join Ugluck's forces once again as the riders of Rohan posed a severe threat. Still, Grishnok never saw eye to eye with the Uruks. Under the cover of the night, Grishnok cornered Merry and Pippin, interrogating them about the One Ring. In a bid to save their lives, Pippin impersonated Gollum as to let the orc know that he knew of the creature's torture in Mordor and the possible location of the One Ring. But Grishnok mistook this for Pippin possessing the ring instead and decided to flee with the two hobbits. But just as he loomed over the poor halflings, Grishnok was shot down by the Rohirrim riders. In Ralph Bakshi's 1978 animation of The Lord of the Rings, Grishnok was the orc with a machete. As the hordes of orcs and Uruks ran to Isengard to deliver the hobbits, Grishnok's water pouch was snatched from him and given to the barely conscious halflings. In Peter Jackson's iteration, Grishnok was a gnarly looking orc played by Stephen Ur, who questioned why they couldn't just eat the hobbits for supper. As the Rohirrim riders ambushed their camp, Grishnok snuck away, nearly getting Merry and Pippin, but he was crushed to death by none other than Treebeard. In his brief appearance in the plot of The Two Towers, we can tell that Grishnok wasn't the strongest orc of the bunch. In fact, he came across as a coward, but perhaps it was wise of him not to go against the Uruks who were thrice his size. But he was the captain of Mordor for a reason. Grishnok was most likely capable of commandeering legions of orcs on the orders of their dark lord Sauron. Yet he was afraid of being caught by the Uruks as he tried to gut Merry and Pippin. His weakness lay in his unchanging nature as a regular orc. <laughs> Shagrat and Gorbag. Shagrat was one of the Mordor Uruk commanders who oversaw the garrisons of Sirith Ungol. The dim-witted Uruk and the rest of his patrol ran into Gorbag's troop from Minas Morgul. Gorbag was a towering orc who served under the Nazgul in Minas Morgul. Shagrat and Gorbag's gang nearly tore each other to shreds when they noticed a peculiar sight. Shagrat lay his eyes on what he believed to be a smaller elf tightly woven in Shelob's webs. Of course, this was actually Frodo Baggins. The Hobbit had been lured into Shelob's lair by Gollum, where he was paralyzed and spun into a tight cocoon by the Great Arachnid. As tensions arose, the two gangs threw themselves at each other, fighting about what was to be done with the smaller elf. Shagrat was ordered to send any and all trespassers straight to Barad-dûr. A distrustful Shagrat managed to drag the smaller elf to the Tower of Sirith Ungol. Looking over the frozen halfling, Shagrat and Gorbag noticed that some of the spider's webs had been cut open. The orc and Uruk argued that there was another 
another elf warrior nearby, yet their search yielded nothing. Shagrat informed Gorbag that his master, the Nazgul, had felt something slip by. They most likely felt Sam, who bore the weight of the One Ring until he managed to rescue Frodo. Upon searching an unconscious Frodo for his belongings, Gorbag found his mithril undercoat and discreetly tried to usurp Shagrat's command in the Tower of Sirith Ungol, but the Uruk had his troops to back him up. However, Gorbag's Uruks fought back, and a bloody rampage between Orc and Uruk ensued until none remained. But Shagrat trampled Gorbag to death and ran straight to his Dark Lord to deliver the news of what had transpired. It isn't known whether Shagrat was killed for his foolishness or rewarded for his loyalty by letting him commandeer troops in the Battle of Moranin. When Sam finally made his way up the tower disguised as an orc, he realized that most of his foes had wiped each other out. Now, Shagrat's strength lay in the fact that he was able to fight off a whole troop of orcs from Minas Morgul. He was also stationed nearer to Shelob's lair, hinting at the fact that he may have been able to hold his own against the monstrous spider. To be fair, Shagrat was also a loyal Uruk, one who took instructions too literally and followed them to a T. Shagrat also seemed to be in charge of the comings and goings in the Tower of Sirith Ungol. On the other hand, Gorbag seemed to be in charge of Minas Morgul's comings and goings. He also had a number of orcs beneath his command who willingly tried to usurp their superior counterparts. However, their greed and desire for glory ended in Shagrat and Gorbag being killed. As the instinct-driven creatures that they were, they foolishly flew too close to the sun. Gothmog! No, we're not talking about the Balrog, obviously, but the disfigured Lieutenant of Morgul was one who was powerful enough to be the Witch King's second-in-command. As we know, the Lord of the Nazgul was the greatest captain of Sauron's armies. Gothmog was also from the dead city of Minas Morgul. He's most popularly known for his crucial role in the Battle of Pelennor Fields. In Peter Jackson's Return of the King, Gothmog was the orc maneuvering a fleet of orcs across the Anduin to kickstart the Battle of Osgiliath. The capital city of Gondor was soon swarmed with a second legion of orcs from Minas Morgul. One of Faramir's lieutenants and fellow Ithilien ranger named Madril was wounded at the mercy of the orcs. The film portrayed the orc leader Gothmog spearing the man without a second thought. After Osgiliath fell, the forces of Mordor bled into Pelennor Fields. As Minas Tirith was evacuated, the Dark Lord Sauron's shadow moved across the sun, plunging the world into near darkness. As a significant commander, Gothmog was part of an army which consisted of 10,000 Haradrim, Easterlings, and Oliphons, along with his own kind, the Orcs of Mordor. Against them stood the forces of good, the honored guardsmen of Minas Tirith, men from Gondor, Forlong, and Imrahil, a few hundred from Dunhir, Ringo Vale, Lamedon, and of course, the relief numbers of the Rohirrim Riders. The Witch King soared in from Minas Morgul and ordered Gothmog to launch a siege upon Minas Tirith. The Orc questioned his master about Gandalf, who the Witch King promised to break. Just as Faramir and a couple of other Knights of Gondor tried to reclaim Osgiliath, Gothmog ordered a volley of arrows to be showered upon them. He then used the decapitated head of one of the Knights and catapulted it into Minas Tirith to sway the morale of the soldiers. As the Lieutenant of Morgul, Gothmog was in charge of nearly all ground operations. He organized the catapults to relentlessly tear down the Citadel's walls and erected siege towers for his forces to invade it as well. The Orc commander ordered Sauron's great battering ram, Grond, to smash open Gondor's gates. Tolkien described the Grond as a weapon imbued with the Witch King's evil magic, which was able to break through the barrier after just three hits. In the film, the soldiers of Gondor began launching the debris of their walls back into the masses of orcs. His forces seemed wary of the incoming barrage of boulders, but Gothmog demanded that they stay still. When a rock came hurtling towards him, the orc commander moved out of the way at the last second, then spat on the rock in mockery, and that's as badass as it gets in Lord of the Rings, honestly. Now, the extended edition of Return of the King showed Gothmog going against Eowyn, who brought him to the ground by slashing his leg. What followed was the prophetic duel and destruction of the Witch King by Eowyn's hand, since she wasn't technically a man. Gothmog managed to rise, fueled by the fury of of his master being slain. Just as he swung at Rohan's shield maiden, Aragorn swooped in and sliced his arm off, followed shortly by Gimli, who killed the Lieutenant of Morgul once and for all. Gothmog can be considered one of the strongest orcs in the Lord of the Rings in terms of authority. After the demise of the Witch King, Gothmog instructed the remaining troops of Trolls, Southrons, Vyregs, and the Easterlings to step into battle from Osgiliath, which reinforced the enemy even if their end was near. When it came to Gothmog's origins, it was speculated that he was either a black new Numenorian, stunted Nazgul, or simply a black Uruk from Mordor, one of the first to come into existence. 
Whatever he may be, by the looks of him, thanks to Peter Jackson's iteration, Gothmog appeared to be a seasoned veteran. His most notable strengths include his abilities to command the armies of Sauron, efficiently strategize on the battlefield, and attempt to manipulate the courage of his opponents. One could say his weakness was his cockiness, which did get him killed, or he was following orders as he was bred to do so. After all, the death of his master prompted him to clumsily attack Eowyn. Boom! Could Bolg of the Misty Mountains really live up to his father's name, or was he simply a receiver of Legolas's cool moves? We're saving the best for last, so let's talk about this particular Orc Chieftain for now. According to book lore, Bolg had inherited the title of Orc Chieftain after his father, Azog, was killed in the Battle of Asnul Bazaar. For a little context, this battle was one of the final of the larger War of the Dwarves and the Orcs. It also sparked the fires of vengeance in Bolg following his father's humiliating defeat. With his hatred for dwarves, Bolg rallied the orcs of the Misty Mountains and gathered them by Mount Gundabad. Tolkien wrote about how Bolg's host of orcs, goblins, wargs, and bats charged through the Grey Mountains towards Erebor, aka the Lonely Mountain. Here, the battle of the five armies ensued, with the orc chieftain standing against the lake men, wood elves, and dwarves. In the book, the Great Eagles came to the rescue of the Forces of Light, and with them soared in the shapeshifter Bjorn riding atop them. Once most of the wargs and bats had been wiped out, Bjorn was determined to kill Bolg, which he did. Bjorn had forever resented the orcs for driving his people out and away from the mountains. Now, moving on to Peter Jackson's 2010 Hobbit trilogy, which gave this orc way more attention than the small number of times he was mentioned in the books. We get our first look at him in the flashback scene of the Battle of Azanel Bazaar, where Bolg can be seen battling Dwalin. Given the fact that Bolg was most likely the strongest of the strong orcs as part of Azog's bloodline, the fact that he was able to hold his own against Dwalin was an impressive feat. In the 2013 film, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog, Bolg's father, Azog, was ordered to call off his hunt of Thor and Oakenshield and company. The White Orc was summoned to Dol Guldur instead, where he was asked to lead the armies of Morgul by Sauron's non-corporeal form. Bolg was given command of tracking down Thorin's company. The Orc chieftain gathered a band of orcs and traced the dwarves all the way to Mirkwood, where Legolas and Toriel chased them out in style. Meanwhile, the dwarves remained rolling around in their barrels. Bolg finally managed to find the dwarves in Bard's house in Lake Town. This time, however, Bolg employed stealth as he lurked about Bard the Bowman's roof until he could ambush the dwarves. Instead, he was confronted by Legolas wielding the Orcist instead. It turned out that Legolas was battling an orc who could keep up with his otherworldly moves. Preceding the Battle of the Five Armies, Bolg was given a separate troop of orcs from Gundabad when he was told that the elves would be present in the battle as well. When Thorin Oakenshield and his nephews, Killy and Philly, were lured to Ravenhill, Bolg was the one who mercilessly killed Killy, much to Toriel's grief. In the end, Bolg was confronted by Legolas in a, dare we say, infamous fight sequence. With Legolas's sword knocked out of his hand, he delivered the killing blow with one of his handy battle knives. Bolg was stabbed, pushed off the cliff, and crushed by a boulder to seal the deal. Now, in terms of physical prowess and intellect, Bolg scored second on this list of strongest orcs. He was said to be an incredible leader with brilliant tactical skills. After all, he was made in charge of the orc troops in place of his father, but unlike his father, Bolg savored a quick-on-his-feet, lightning-fast style of combat. This orc didn't always need his blades. His opponent's weight was used against them, and a couple of well-placed punches were more than enough. He was seemingly numb to physical pain, as we saw in the moment when Legolas stabbed him in the leg. Apart from all of this, Bolg was driven by his madness, so to speak. With a seemingly higher intelligence than any other puny orc, Bolg was also a sadistic psychopath, one who would go out of his way to harm, even against orders. Not to mention, the hulking orc was very unpleasant to look at. Azog the Defiler. Last but not least, we come to the White Orc himself. Remember that battle we mentioned earlier? The larger war had been fueled by Azog's slaying of the Dwarven King. For you see, in the year 2790 of the Third Age, King Thror wished nothing more than to reclaim their once glorious kingdom of Khazad Dûm, which was overrun by creatures of the dark at this point. That included Azog, the chieftain of the Orcs of Moria, who resided in the dark ruins of the mine. Although it was said that Azog was specially sent to Moria as part of his large scheme, but as the Dwarven King Thror tried to enter the kingdom through the Great Gates, he was pulled in by Azog's minions. Inside, they horrifically beheaded the king as Azog idly carved his own name on the forehead. He then flung the brutalized head and a sparse coin purse at Nar, the king's companion, who awaited him outside. When Thror's son Thrain was told of this, he was obviously enraged as he declared an all-out war on the orc defiler. Hence, the War of the Dwarves and Orcs began with the Longbeards tirelessly hunting down the White Orc. 
The end was the great climactic battle of Azen al Bazar, which saw Thrain's son, Thorin, fighting bravely in battle. His shield broke during combat, after which he was forced to use a makeshift oak branch. Hence, his later name became Thorin Oakenshield II. The battle took a turn when Nain, the great lord of the Iron Hills, marched in with reinforcements from Iron Hills. His troops cut smoothly to the front of the lines, all the while they chanted, or more like cursed, Azog's name over and over again. The great white orc emerged to duel with an exhausted yet furious name. Sadly, the dwarf was killed when his neck was snapped by the orc, but in his blissful victory, what Azog didn't notice was his personal guard had been killed, and Nain's son, Dane, was seconds away from avenging his father's death if it was the last thing he did. Dane Ironfoot II then chopped Azog's head off, mounted it on a pike, and stuffed the same mockery of a coin purse in the dead orc's mouth. Following his death, the command over the orcs of the Misty Mountains was passed down to his son, Bol. Now, in Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy, Azog wasn't killed at the Battle of Azanel Bazaar. Instead, his arm was sliced off, and he was dragged back into the depths of Moria. Over the course of the three films, Azog is a driving force, one of the trinity of antagonists, along with Smaug the Dragon and Sauron himself. Now, in the live-action adaptations of The Hobbit, Azog was declared the largest orc to have ever walked Middle-earth. But does this automatically make him the strongest? In the films, Azog is given the title of the Defiler, referring back to his actions during this fateful battle. As Balin recounted the tragedy, Azog had beheaded King Thror and fought Thorin until the dwarf's shield gave way, forcing him to use the Oak Branch. Near the beginning of the quest for Erebor, captain of the Gundabad orcs Yasneg reported that Thorin was indeed alive and traveling with a company of dwarves. Yasneg was then fed to Azog's white warg for this, as the orcs swore to wipe out the line of Durin. By the end of the film, An Unexpected Journey, Azog finally cornered Thorin and his company, who had all shimmied up pine trees for safety. Unfortunately, the Defiler and his warg riders nearly bring the trees to the ground. Thorin, nearly shaking with vengeance and anger, charged at the pale orc and was knocked aside by his great mace. Just as Thorin was about to be beheaded like his grandfather, a very brave Bilbo Baggins jumped in to save him. In the following film, Azog and his pack of warg riders were forced to keep their distance from Thorin and company as they were under the temporary protection of Bjorn, the Skin Changer. But soon, the Pale Orc was summoned to Dol Guldur, where he was called away from the Dwarf Hunt and instead made commander of Morgul's armies by Sauron, who went by the Necromancer at this point in time. When Gandalf the Grey investigated this dark stronghold, he was ambushed by Azog, who hinted at an upcoming Dark Age. Finally, in the Battle of the Five Armies, Azog led the Orc army from Moria along with a few ogres and trolls. He expressed disappointment in his son Bolg for not being able to kill Legolas and Toriel. The film cleverly depicted the use of signal flares, which instructed his armies to attack at a particular moment. Azog also managed to summon the Wereworms, which dug great tunnels underneath. Just as he was about to lead a charge on the dwarves, they formed a wall with their spiked shields. Then, the elves leapt up from behind right into their front lines. This elf-dwarf combo caught the orcs off guard as a whole legion of them were brought down. Azog then shifted his attention to a weak spot, the poorly guarded Kingdom of Dale. In the end, Azog lured Thorin and his nephews to Raven Hill. Here, Azog murdered Philly just as Bolg had killed Killy. Finally, Thorin fights to the death with his bloodline's ultimate foe. In the end, they both kill each other, fulfilling their thirst for vengeance in the most unlikely way imaginable. So, Azog the Defiler was hands down the strongest orc in Tolkien's lore. As seen in the films, Azog was a Herculean orc who would have towered over the mightiest Urakai. His appearance distinguished him with his deathly pale skin and unsettlingly frosty eyes. Azog was an orc who exuded lethal power. He didn't look like a traditional orc who was often messily ugly, like a barely put together mockery of Iluvatar's creations. Instead, Azog appeared sleek, less barbaric. His arm, which had been cut off in the film, was replaced with a rudimentary prosthetic instead of a stump. He went to such lengths to replace his arm so he could continue fighting like he always had. He swapped this out for a razor sharp blade in the Battle of the Five Armies. Azog's body was also crisscrossed with scars that ran deep, testaments of his survival in brutal battles. Azog, the bloodthirsty pale orc, was perhaps the most efficient orc warrior to ever exist. But perhaps we're just convinced of that because he got the most screen time out of the rest. But even as per book lore, he didn't just play a part, but orchestrated entire wars. Azog was malicious in a way that he didn't simply seek to physically hurt his enemies, but break their minds first. His combat style ensured that his foes couldn't get too close to him, thanks to his great white warg who pinned them down with ease. The evidence of Azog's strength lay in the 
fact that he went against a few of the most durable dwarves in the history of Middle-earth. He was also brave enough to confront Amaya, Gandalf, in Dol Guldur. Azog the Defiler was undeniably a remarkable commander for Sauron's armies. Displaying creative strategies with the concept of signal flags allowed for swift attacks from all directions. That, and his determination, made him nearly successful in wiping out the line of Durin forever. Marvelous Verdicts there we have it, folks. We've compared a few of the most notable orcs in Tolkien's history. Some were downright dim-witted, while others were concerningly sentient. But do you agree that the nature of their creation was a tragedy in itself? Or was their existence necessary as a dark force to counter the light and bring balance? A race that changed the course of history and challenged powerful bloodlines across Middle-earth. Either way, Tolkien's orcs remain malevolent monsters, irredeemable in the eyes of their author. That's all we got for this time, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This is Wizard Wheezy signing off. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.